Hello, we're settling in. We're getting our lunch. I know there are people grabbing food. Hello, hello, and welcome. Welcome to the Kelly Writers House. Uh, my name is Jessica Loanthal. I'm the director here. I'm glad you're all here. Um, this is now an annual gathering. This is a thing we do every year. It's a annual gathering to discuss careers in journalism. But this year, it's a hyper big, expansive version of this panel um, because it's the 20th anniversary of the Nora Maggot Mentorship Prize. So that's the occasion here, and it's really exciting. Um, we at Writer's House are so happy to be honoring Nora Maggot and her students, and now the students of her students and the mentees of her students, um, because Nora Maggot prize is actually more than a prize. It's a, it's a community. It's, it's a cult. <laughs> it's an ethos. Um, basically, this is a community of people who are really deeply invested in the idea that writers and, and journalists, but writers really, benefit from mentoring and benefit from being in a community. And so we're, we at Writer's House are totally fan of that ethos, and so it really makes sense that we have this connection. So uh, this panel is co-sponsored, I should say, by our Povich Journalism Fund, the Creative Writing Program, the Daily Pennsylvanian, and of course the good folks of the Nora Prize. Um, so this afternoon, the focus is political journalism. We have kind of an awe-inspiring panel. Um, it's weird because I feel like I've known everybody here for years in very different contexts, including most, many of you as students at some point. So I feel <laughs> ancient um, that I'm now uh, inspired and awe-filled. Um, but so our focus today is political journalism. Tonight it'll be more generally careers in journalism. Um, to get this going, I'm going to hand it over to Stephen, who he'll say a little bit more about Nora Maggot and how students in the room can apply for this prize and um, be part of this community. But I also want to say, you're here, so you're part of this community. That's the point of this program. So um, Stephen is here. He is a author, a journalist, and I have to say, a tireless advocate for this kind of connectivity. Please help me welcome Stephen Freed. Thank you. I'm going to be incredibly brief, which none of these people believe. Um, so this is the 20th anniversary of the Nora Prize. Nora Maggot died in 1991, um, and 10 years after her death, uh, her uh, the alumni of her of her uh, teaching decided to create a prize like this, and we started awarding it 20 years ago. Um, Ashley was the second winner, and I won't give you the years of everybody else. Um, and so because of the 20th anniversary, uh, Kelly Writers House, which always supports us in these events, uh, fell for my plan to bring in everybody for overnight uh, and to do three sessions. And the thing that's much more interesting than that is that this is the first year that the Nora Prize winners are running the sessions. So I'm really just going to introduce the prize, then I'm going to introduce uh, one of the Nora Prize winners, Jess Goodman, um, and then the Nora Prize winners are running this session. They're running the Careers in Media session tonight at 5.30 here. Uh, and we're doing a very special session tomorrow morning at 9.30 that Matt is running. It's really for working journalists, and only 16 people can do it. Um, but there's still a couple more spaces, but it's uh, all these people plus other journalists talking about how you develop story ideas from concepts. Um, and I think you'll be talking about like really big deal stories that they have done, and you'll have an opportunity to talk about your own. So if you haven't signed up for that, please do. If you hadn't planned on being here tonight at 5.30, please come. There will be food afterwards. And if you are interested in the Nora Prize, we created a QR code, we meaning my assistant, Meg. Um, uh, you can get that there. You can go online. I'm not going to talk a lot about it. It's a wonderful prize. It's $5,000. It's given to the top nonfiction writer, senior at Penn. And we also uh, have named finalists. We work with the finalists as well. It's all about creating an ongoing nonfiction mentorship community mm -hmm. in uh, in each new generation, but also keeping the nonfiction writers of the previous generations connected. So that's what this is all about. And now I will stop. Um, I'm going to introduce Jess Goodman. Jess Goodman uh, is the New York Times bestselling author, I love how that sounds, of young adult novels, including The Legacies, They Wish They Were Us. Um, she might write one about this session. Um, she was the op-ed editor at Cosmopolitan. She has held editorial positions at Entertainment Weekly and Huffington Post. 
She graduated from the college where she was the editor of 34th Street Magazine. So Jess, you're in charge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're so excited to be here. Um, and I think we should just kind of jump right in. So I'm going to go down and give a little bit of brief, some brief bios for these incredible folks. And then we'll just start talking about how to report on politics, which, as you probably could tell from my bio, I don't know how to do. So I'm going to learn as much as you guys are. So first, we have Matt Flegenheimer, who is a correspondent at The New York Times. His primary focus is long-form profiles of notable figures in politics and otherwise for The Times and The Times Magazine. Since joining the paper in 2011, he has covered two presidential campaigns, the Trump era in Washington, New York City Transportation, and City Hall. And then we have Ashley Parker, who is a senior national political correspondent for the Washington Post and a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner. Most recently, she served as the White House bureau chief covering the first two years of the Biden presidency, as well as the entirety of the Trump presidency. In 2019, Ashley also served as one of the moderators of the Democratic presidential primary debate. You can often catch her on MSNBC. And then we also have Luis Ferre Siderni, who is the Albany bureau chief of the New York Times, where he has covered New York state politics and government since late 2019. He currently covers Governor Kathy Hochul, who succeeded Governor Cuomo, and the state legislature with a focus on New York's affordability crisis and the overlooked ways that lobbying forces shape policy. So please join me in welcoming these incredible panelists today. So I think all of you started in sort of different beats that were not politics. So maybe you could kind of talk a little bit about why you wanted to enter politics and how you went about going from something else into into this space. So we'll just start with Matt and kind of go down okay. the line. Thanks, Jess. Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, I started out at the Times in 2011, and uh, the first bit I had there was transportation in the city. Um, so subways was a big sort of Bike Wars era, City Bike was starting, um, taxi stuff, and there's a lot of politics in that. Um, at the time, it felt like maybe the perfect amount of politics, which was not 100%. Um, and then a couple of years later, I started covering city politics, um, the mayor and uh, the city council and all the rest, and it just felt like a moment to zoom in on the sort of power dynamics in the city. Um, it was a new mayor starting at the time, Bill de Blasio, which shows you how long ago that was. Um, he was very popular for a moment. That also shows you how long ago it was. <laughs> very small um, moment. <laughs> a little window. Um, and I've been sort of in and around um, politics since then. Um, went to the presidential campaign in 2016 with Ashley um, and DC briefly. Um, it's funny, I still don't necessarily consider myself an outright political junkie, mm -hmm. like um, some folks we've worked with um, over the years. <laughs> um, and it's just sort of a fascinating time to be doing it, and that's been the case for a while, for better or worse, and will continue to be. Um, and it felt like, and continues to feel like, um, swerving away from that um, in this moment would be leaving behind a pretty... Um, consequential and objectively interesting story. Um, so that's sort of how I wound up there in the first place and why I still continue to have an interest in it. Yeah. Um, I also fell into politics somewhat accidentally. My for, I grew up outside of DC, so I was, and I was kind of dorky, so I was probably like a little more interested in politics than the average person, <laughs> but like just as a voyeur. Um, and my first job ended up being with Maureen Dowd at the New York Times. I had kind of thought at Penn that I was going to graduate and be a magazine journalist, right? Like if I could have chosen what I was going to do, I would have worked at like Vanity Fair, New York Magazine, um, or Time Magazine, uh, which also in some ways tells you how long ago I graduated. Um, <laughs> And then I, and then uh, the job being Maureen Dowd's research assistant at the Times came up, and I sort of felt like Maureen seemed cool, the Times seemed cool, and I should take it. Um, and you know, working for her, I worked for her from 2005 to 2010, which is I always tell people is even for a great boss is way too long to be an assistant. Like that's just objectively too long, five years. Um, but you know, it was the Obama era. I was out on the campaign trail with her, and I kind of looked at the people who were full time campaign reporters, and I was just like that I want to do that it kind of looked like being on a rolling party bus with your frenemies um, and <laughs> one thing you know went to the next I covered um, so I worked for Maureen then I worked for the Metro desk of the Times then I covered the Mitt Romney campaign because I was just like I want to be out there 
own, you know, um, after Romney, they sent me to cover Congress. Then I covered with Flag the 2016 campaign for the Times. I covered poor, sad, sweet Jeb Bush. We kind of like <laughs> passed the baton between us. Um, and if you then, guys don't want to hear about Jeb Bush, you yeah. should probably leave now because actually I have a lot of stories we want to tell yes, about Jeb can, Bush. Yes, we can go deep. Um, and Jeb. two days after Jeb uh, dropped out, I was sent to cover Donald Trump. And then, you know, as Flag said, Trump it was this huge story. I then moved to the Washington Post, covered him. So I was kind of fallen into politics. I actually don't really think it's my skill set. I keep on threatening <laughs> at some point to, like, finally do what I believe I'm actually good at, which is long-form narrative journalism. So stay tuned. Uh, but I think I will cover politics through the end of 2024 20, at least. Ooh, like a tease for the future. I like that. <laughs> um, I did not want to cover politics. <laughs> I'm still covering it for some reason. I still don't know why. Um, I started off as a summer intern at the Times on the Metro desk covering New York City. Um, got hired full time and then was uh, doing general assignment reporting. Then I covered housing. And a spot opened up in, in Albany, New York's capital. And they offered it to me. And I didn't know any better. And I said yes. Um, <laughs> And it's been a roller coaster ever since. I started at the beginning of 2020, uh, two mm -hmm. months before the pandemic started. Uh, so my first year in Albany was basically covering the government's response to the coronavirus uh, in New York, which was in the epicenter. Um, and that obviously coincided with the rise of the national rise of, of Governor Andrew Cuomo. Following year, it was a year of scandals that, that led to his resignation. Um, and and so it's been in incredibly fun and exciting to cover, um, you know, everything that goes with political reporting, the elections, the backroom deals that lawmakers, you know, cut out in Albany, uh, scandals and resignations. Um, but I think for me, the most fulfilling part has probably been uh, covering the intersection of, of government and politics and sort of explaining to readers how the politics uh, influences the decisions being made by, you know, government officials that and policies that actually affect you know people's people's lives, um, and so so yeah, that's how I got into covering politics. I'm still there. Incredible. Um, you all have such amazing journeys, and I, I feel like also politics is kind of like this. Like everybody views it as like so serious and kind of like po policy driven, which it is, as you talked about. But it's also like incredibly soapy and petty, and like there's so much like interpersonal drama. And I feel like you need to have like a certain kind of personality to like roll with it and like stay on top of everything and also be able to like get these people who really want to talk and also like play other reporters against each other. Like you kind of got to play the system. It seems like, <laughs> yes, I've watched a lot of scandal. Um, and I'm curious like how that has, has figured into your role. Um, and if, and if you think about that at all in terms of like getting people to trust you and sourcing and like knowing how to play your own politics within the reporting game. So maybe we can start with Luis and kind of go back down this way. Sure. Um, yeah, I think the number one thing about, covering politics it's uh, sort of like high school again uh, <laughs> with the politi politicians being the, the high schoolers um, <laughs> there's like a lot of gossip right we traffic in information trade in information um, and and our job is to, to get that information and um, uh, with when it comes to politicians and elected officials and the whole um, you know world around it with lobbyists activists and um, it is it is very gossipy right it is a lot as you might expect and see in movies meeting up with folks for for coffee or drinks and just talking off the record and and um, building a rapport with them and building confidence so that um, when news breaks when you're in a moment of actual crisis where you need to reach someone you have already relationships with the folks who will give you that information that you need um, uh, at, a, at a moment's notice there's a reporter at the times who's you know very good beat reporters very good beat reporter who said that the best way to approach sourcing um, is to imagine like the worst crisis that could happen on your beat. Say it's a resignation, a political scandal, a shooting or whatever. And then think of all the people you would need to reach when that crisis happens mm -hmm. um, and to, to get you know inf information to be able to cover it comprehensively on the spot. And if your list only includes uh, the spokespersons, right? The flax for the government officials. You're not going to get anything. You're not. You're not ready to prepare. You're not ready to cover. Uh, um, you know that that breaking news. So it's a it's a matter of um, uh, building those relationships, building a list, and 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 reaching out to to folks to be prepared for those sort of you know moments. 
Yeah, um, picking up on that, I whenever I start a beat before there is like that crisis moment, I always try to get people to meet me in person um, when I don't need anything from them, right? Like I operate on the belief that if, maybe the shaky belief that if someone meets me in person, they will like me more. Um, so I will just try to get them to get coffee or lunch or drinks with me and I'll kind of say like, at some point I'm gonna write something you're not gonna like and you're gonna wanna yell at me and like this way you'll know what I look like. Like you'll, like you'll know what I look like when I'm flustered and like you'll have my cell phone number. So that's one thing. And then sourcing is just, you know, it's sort of just like, being a human or being a Penn student. And, you know, I think everyone kind of like, <laughs> no, you kind of like work the angles yeah. you have. And, you know, like, uh, Flag and I know someone, um, was at the Times, I was at Politico, J Mart, right? Who like speaks in like political riddles. And that like works for him with, for the, you know, for the junkie set, right? Like, um, I, you know, for instance, like, I am now a mom and I tweet a lot about my kids and like, Sometimes that prompts sources like out of the blue to to like DM me and be like, my daughter too just ate trash, you know, <laughs> and like that's a link. And I actually once got a big scoop from someone who called me and was like, I respect the fact that, you know, that you like acknowledge the fact that you have children, right? That like you can do a job <laughs> and like also be a mother. I mean, I'm sure that's also like turned off some people, right? So you know, that's one thing. If you, there's like some people who, when I was covering Romney, we would have these like women's dinners with, you know, the female, um, some female reporters and some of the female aides, right? Like there's some people who can like bro out, like it's just whatever works for you. And I kind of try to dabble in the various dark arts. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Definitely pro dark arts. Um, Yeah, it's a funny thing. I mean, there's such a, um, if we were to stereotype about reporters that we know, it can be a socially awkward bunch, um, <laughs> and yet demands so much of you socially <laughs> um, in some of these circumstances that Ashley's describing. Um, I mean, I agree with everything that the two of uh, you have said already. I, to, to just his first prompt, it is a really interesting thing because there is such this sort of soapy, ridiculous, petty, um, operatic, dramatic, whatever uh, thread to a lot of these stories and also the stakes can be incredibly high um, and are and continue to be. So there is this sort of daily tension between recognizing which parts of that drama um, warrant a kind of amplification and which are just the noise. Um, And I think especially the last math, seven years, (laughs) um, maybe eight years, from the sort of beginnings of the Trump campaign, that has been um, an often complicated exercise in sort of what matters and what doesn't. Um, anyway, yeah. that that feels like uh, a relatively um, consistent tension in, in the kind of work we're all doing. Totally, and I feel like this week in particular is crazy if you've been following what's going on in Congress. Um, like Speaker McCarthy was kicked out, and this is like one of those moments I think that all of you have covered in in various various instances where people are so hungry for someone to make sense of what's going on and to explain the situation to them with thoughtful analysis, but also like inside scoops and kind of like you know palace intrigue and drama. And I'm curious like how you all handle these really intense moments where you kind it seems like perhaps you might have to drop everything and like cover this story or not if that's not your role but like how do you handle these really intense moments that are not just important for your careers and your your jobs but also like massively significant for the country so maybe we can start with Ashley and then go to Matt and then Louise sure um I mean, I think, again, like a little off topic, but the idea of the these dramas and these personal things, they inform the actual big things. And so, you know, like a, a gossipy thing might be that McCarthy and his people hate Steve Scalise, right? Like that's just kind of gossipy and it's fun to know and you know little tidbits of how they, you know, like talk smack about him. But then when McCarthy is kicked out of speaker and Steve Scalise and Jim Jordan are both running, you know, that helps inform like why McCarthy's team is going to like behind the scenes at the very least, this has been publicly reported, like help Jim Jordan, you know, Mm. try to get the speakership. So it, you know, you kind of need to know those fun little tidbits to get the big story. And whoever becomes speaker, as Louis said, will have real world impacts for 
for policies and for for Congress. Um, and I find actually those big moments like you, where you have to drop everything, but just like super fun, right? Like the day yeah. flies by because you're so busy and like you're. I don't know that. Like I mean, now again, now that I'm a parent, like my first and my husband also is a journalist for a competing publication, and we have the same beat. So like the first <laughs> thing we do is we text our nanny <laughs> and like ask her to stay late. Um, but then you kind of just like get to drop everything, and it's like they're just like nothing better. <laughs> I agree with all that. Um, although, despite saying that, I basically don't cover a ton of day-to-day -day chaos <laughs> right. anymore. Um, and that's been nice, and sort of being able to um, step back and um, spend a little more time with a, a given story. Um, obviously, it can still be sort of on the news in a way that's chaotic. Um, I've had this strange run of um, basically every magazine profile I've done for the last couple of years um, has including uh, the former governor of New York, as Louise knows well, um, has sort of been assigned, and then all hell breaks loose for that particular person. Um, so it can often I think that's feel... why they're assigned. No, yeah. obviously. Um, so there's a little bit of like an angel of death quality to these assignments when uh, somebody... Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think actually... I mean, there is... Um, time moves in such an odd way in some of those moments, I feel like. Um, and you're capable sometimes of so much more <laughs> in a given day than you realize um, <laughs> when you, you know, I feel like there are moments on longer term stories where you're just like banging your head against the wall. You're trying to make calls. Basically nothing works out. You've accomplished nothing of actionable value for this story. And it's like, all right, that was Tuesday. And then <laughs> there's a moment, um, I think, but you know, like like a, a Cuomo resignation is a good example. I got pulled into that because I had done the magazine story on him, and Louise and I, I think, worked on a couple of stories together. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the amount of chaotic like source texting and retopping a story, and you know, trying to figure out precisely what he said to the senior team that he you know was informing he was leaving um, happens in like twenty seven minutes, and you're like, wow. Pretty, pretty productive uh, early stretch of, of this Tuesday. Um, and, and there is something really exhilarating about that. And um, there are moments where you can feel the stakes of it in a way that's um, really kind of uh, emotionally buoying and can make the days when it feels like uh, less uh, essential exercise uh, more worthwhile. And very very brief village there's like a there's like an adrenaline and a kind of like forward motion that just like ha and muscle memory that happens in those moments like you can almost even see in the newsroom right like when people are in the newsroom like something would pop on twitter right and like one person's like oh shit did you see this and then like they stand up from their desk and like start running right and then like two other people are running with them and then like you're at the editor desk in the vet you know it's like go okay i'll start writing you start texting you call once this there's person. some jogging it's really great yeah, yeah. <laughs> that still happens sometimes yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um yeah i i think those big moments of the first ones i got to cover were actually like nerve-wracking and then once you get through them you get through the day you you wake up the next morning you see what was published you see the entire coverage and you're like oh we, we did that. I did that. <laughs> and you gain, a, you know, you, you, you get a, a bit more, more confidence heading into it. Um, but I think a lot of it is also preparation and preparing for those big moments. I think the Cuomo resignation was one where mm -hmm. we knew not necessarily that necessarily that it was inevitable, but that it could very well happen at some point. Um, so like, you know, I had been, I had spent months working on his political obit for when the moment, if the moment happened, you know, we were ready to, to, to go with that. Um, cause th that day you're being pulled in so many different directions nowadays. You're asked to live tweet, you're asked to live blog, you have to do analysis, you have to do takeaway pieces, uh, you have to get the insider account of what was happening in the room when, when he resigned, which Matt thankfully helped us out <laughs> with that day. <laughs> um, and, and thankfully we work at news organizations where it, it, you know, a lot of it is a team effort and you have very talented reporters working with you who have, uh, very, uh, uh, deep bench of sources for when that moment comes. Um, so going back to that, you know, the, the, what I was mentioning earlier about uh, having, you know, being well, well sourced and being prepared, it, it all pays off in, in these very big moments, as I'm sure it did for folks covering the, the McCarthy uh, shenanigans this week. <laughs> shenanigans is a good word yeah. for it. Yeah. Um, you've all kind of talked a little bit about collaboration and like working with other reporters. And I feel like 
reporters in general, sometimes pol- political reporters, get the reputation of being like really cutthroat and kind of like wanting to like, you know, mess up the other one's story. And it doesn't sound like that's the case for you guys, especially some of you who've worked together before. So I'm curious, like, is that true? Like, is, <laughs> is there a real collaboration that goes on within your team? And, you know, or is there is it kind of like every reporter for themselves sometimes? Matt, you want to start? You know, there's ever been a personal conflict between two reporters in the history of um, journalism at right, the New York all, Times, as far as I can tell. Dory. Um, <laughs> I think it's broadly, I, it's it's interesting. It, I, I think it's broadly been a more collaborative um, industry, in my experience, than I would have expected sitting here 15 years ago. Um, and yet, <laughs> um, <laughs> look, there are a lot of. Um, in the sort of job I have now, it's interesting because I, I'm really not on a beat. I'm not covering the same people every day. I'm not outside of the speaker's office waiting for McCarthy or whoever it becomes to walk out. Um, and when I come in on something, um, it's often on somebody else's turf to some degree. So there's an amount of diplomacy required. And sometimes that means collaborating. Sometimes it means um, trying to... Um, draw the sort of extended expertise um, that somebody on the beat has out and um, make them feel included in the process um, and okay about it. I think we've all had moments um, on both sides of that where we've felt, I've certainly, you know, in the campaign in 2016, it was uh, not uncommon for um, a more senior reporter to come in and, you know, um, take control of the story and that's how it goes and that makes sense and they're excellent for a reason and that's the sort of thing that happens a lot um but you know it's almost like engaging with sources a sort of baseline humanity and um menschiness feels important and i think for the most part that's been my experience yeah um i i will say i think the era of like triple and quadruple bylines um, sort of began with Trump, actually, because there was so much news happening um, every day that was, you know, uh, you know, felt unprecedented um, and was objectively unprecedented and would often break at like 5 p.m. And to do these stories, you you just needed to throw multiple people at them and also With Trump, um, you know, normally when you cover politics, you always, you know, source stuff and check stuff, of course. But there was this era where if, you know, it felt like Democrats, Republicans, you know, if if Valerie Jarrett or David Axelrod told you something, right, it was probably true. um, You'd still have to check it and confirm it and get multiple sources. Same thing, Karen Hughes or Karl Rove about Bush. But with Trump, six people could come out of a meeting um, and you could get six different accounts of what happened in that meeting and like the only way to accurately cover him was to understand all of the people in that meeting all of their motivations and who they were trying to knife um and you know say like i heard this from so and so but you know so and so hates that person and you know and so you'd have to to call 30 or 40 people and kind of get this like kaleidoscopic lens to actually understand the truth and like one person simply can't do that beginning at 5 15 and you probably have to publish the story like file the story you have to file the story so that era of multiple bylines um i think started in in the trump era um and then i I also think, um, and I know I don't know if this is an advice panel or not, but one thing that has been striking yeah, to we me love is advice. when I yeah. graduated from college, like my understanding was, and I think this was true, that at places like the Times or the Post to get hired there, you had to be able to do all things, right? Like some people were more stylists, some people more, were more reporters, but like you kind of had, it's like basketball. You had to be able to like shoot and dribble and pass and play defense all at like a six or seven, and then you were maybe a nine or 10 at others. And now it is stunning how many people can like, only report and are great reporters, but like cannot write. So like they can send you a bunch of bullet points, but like could they do a noun verb? Eh. And same thing, there's like a lot of people who are like wonderful stylists, but like don't actually understand how to sit at their desk and make 12 calls. So you often get pairings as well that are complimentary. Um, And I will say if you are coming out of college, like the most valuable thing you can do is like be able to write 
be able to report and like be able to be like a nominally professional adult who like meets deadlines and doesn't have temper tantrums and you will just like (laughs) soar. You make it sound so easy. (laughs) Yeah, I think for for the most part, there is this perception. A lot of it is true that uh, reporters, um, it's a very independent role. You have, it's you and your editor and, and, and your beat and um, it can be sometimes very territorial and there's obviously different egos in the newsroom and some some might be more competitive than than others for but for the most part I found my colleagues to be incredibly collegial and everyone's helping each other out right if someone on another beat happens to hear something from their source that could be beneficial for for me in Albany they'll they'll pass it along and um, in the same way I'll hear from like the transportation reporter or the housing reporter or the climate reporter and they'll come to me and ask me like hey what are you hearing about like this bill up in Albany what's happening with that or this um, and we'll you know we'll collaborate and sometimes it's just you need to collaborate and work with others to be able to get um, a story quickly out there given the competitive demands like this week I was working on a story with with two other reporters um, involving um, uh, Robert Menendez senator from New Jersey who got uh, indicted on uh, federal bribery charges um, he got he received like gold bars and ca- piles of cash and a Mercedes and we had we had uh, we knew from the indictment that the Mercedes uh, was because the wife had been in a, in a, in a crash car in a, in a car accident um, and we were trying to figure out what what is this car accident like what exactly happened and we started digging into it and we got a tip that it might have been a fatal car accident where she killed a pedestrian and we started sort of mobilizing because we knew it was a competitive story others would be on it and it took three of us to you know put in public records requests uh work like the police and try to get records from them uh like old school reporting go door knocking and talk to folks try to get witnesses to like talk to us um uh and also just work with the sources different sources that each reporter had um in in that story and we were able to to get it up uh, yesterday, but and it took us maybe like five days of reporting. But if it would have been just me or, or one of them, it would have taken maybe three weeks. Um, so it's it's incredibly important for for like the big stories, and especially in this era with uh, everything that's going on. And I feel like in both of your cases, I mean, covering all of the White House or all of the state government, you sort of necessarily intersect with other beats yeah. that are you know more specialized in a certain area. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm also kind of just like amazed at how much history you all have witnessed in the past 10 plus years. And I'm curious if there ever has been a time where you as a person had to kind of like balance the you as a reporter in terms of like what you're witnessing and how it fits into history and significance or if the, or if you're just always kind of in reporter mode, putting your emotions on the back burner. Maybe we can hmm. start with Matt. You seem to have an I mean, immediate response. <laughs> election Night 2016 probably is up there. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, well, whatever. I, I basically wound up um, writing uh, the uh, main news story about Trump's election. Um, because it because exist. <laughs> it existed in like a 500 word unedited <laughs> Version that and was here. I am talking about Monday. preparation, right? Yeah, um, and I wrote it because um, I would not have been the first choice to write the lead story on election night, and things broke in a direction that we didn't necessarily expect. Um, and I, I'm actually proud of what uh, we put out that night. And um, our pal Michael Barbaro and I were locked away in a room um, for many hours of that Tuesday evening, trying to pull together a story that could reflect the enormity and um, gravity and um, shock of what was happening. Um, But yeah, in some of those moments, um, and that one just sort of leaped to mind, you definitely um, are acutely aware of um, the fact that you will remember (laughs) what is happening (laughs) for quite some time. Yeah, Yeah, I think with, for for me, it's with political journalism, the the, one of the undercurrents is just, realizing how much quick and uh, deep impact your reporting can have on on the news cycle, on what actually happens in government. Um, and 
and the ramifications of of all that and you know when you're in it in the moment you're being you're 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 carried and fueled by adrenaline and a lot of coffee and not a lot of sleep um but when you look back in hindsight right and and, and sort of look at the, the the arc of it all you realize that reporters and the media are not only sort of witnessing the history but playing a sometimes pretty active role in it yeah. um you know with with cuomo's um downfall that that whole year a lot of it was fueled by uh reporting really right on on not just the uh, sexual harassment allegations against him but great reporting um on the way that his government tried to cover up nursing deaths nursing home deaths during the pandemic uh reporting about how he got a, a book deal a five million dollar book deal uh during the pandemic um uh to to write uh, some sort of memoir um, that book came out in like October of 2020 about like right. how we won the pandemic. Right. right. <laughs> During the pandemic. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and a whole bunch of others sort of uh, sketchy things that his, that his government was doing. And that was all, you know, uh, driven by by uh, by our reporting and, and, and the media's coverage. And it's maybe not until you're on the other side of it that you look back and, and you realize sort of the, the uh, impact that right it could, it could have. Um, I do think, I sort of feel like looking back, if I had experienced the past, I don't know, decade as like a pure human, it would have been very stressful, actually. Um, it was. But, <laughs> but as a journalist, I kind of, I feel like in the moment, I often, um, there's like, it's a little bit through like a slight remove or a lens because I'm reporting on it and then I only process it. Um, a little later, um, although there are weird ways where it obviously intersects with your real life. I live in Washington, D.C. Um, my daughter, who's now, you know, uh, like almost five, but she was in a nanny share at the time, and they used to, during COVID, because they didn't want to go to playgrounds with other kids, they would always go and play on the grass um, at the Capitol. But kind of as I was covering uh, what was going on in the run-up um, after the election, you know, uh, to to what turned out to be the insurrection, um, I had this sense that it was like not the best idea for my Aww. daughter and her friend and like the nanny crew, you know, to be on the grass in front of the Capitol. And, and our nanny actually, who because she was at the Capitol every day was like buds with all the Capitol police, like also arrived at the same conclusion, right? So there's this weird world where I'm reporting on it and they're also like, changing where they spend their days. Um, so there's that kind of weird intersection. That's wild. I'm glad your daughter wasn't there that day. <laughs> um, okay, great. So I'm, I, I think we're, we're almost at a, a good place to kind of open it up to, to Q&A from the group. Um, but before we, we get to that, I was wondering if there are any just like really wild war stories you guys want to share maybe about like one kind of oh my god I can't believe this this is happening to me moment whether it was like on a campaign trail moderating a presidential debate which is crazy um or or anything else where you're just like I can't believe this is my life this is so cool scary wild I'll give you a moment to think um well <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say covering Andrew Cuomo as a reporter, <laughs> you would get a lot of uh, late night and early morning calls from him and his team over over coverage. Uh, a lot of those were off the record conversations uh, and or screaming <laughs> matches. No, I would never scream back. Um, but I'll, I'll I, I don't yeah I'll leave that at that. I I was thinking though like one big and this maybe is a, you know a, a lesson and still kicking myself on on the head about this one big regret I had when I uh, first began covering Albany my first week in, in the state capital I'm like new there I'm starting to get sourced up set up meetings with all bunch of different folks to to uh, to meet and I get a handwritten letter um, from the lieutenant governor at the time Kathy Hochul. Um, it, welcoming me to the press corps, um, asking me if, if I wanted to, to go to, to lunch. At that point, she was lieutenant governor. It was a purely ceremonial role. She, she was like a nobody, a nobody. She had no power. Um, so a nice lady. Very impressive. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that I that kind of got lost lost in the shuffle, <laughs> and I sort of put it aside. And I, I was like, oh, I have like more important people to meet. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> fast forward a year and a half later, that's Governor Kathy Hochul now. Um, and it would have been very nice to have had lunch with her on my first week and maybe get, get her cell phone number and have, a, have established a relationship with her early on. So the um, <laughs> lesson is, like, take every meeting, take every lunch, send every email, reach out, make those phone calls. Uh, you never know you who's going to be governor. Did you, did, you, did you and Governor Hochul ever talk about this? Or? No, I, no, I never brought it up. Uh, <laughs> but you know she remembers. We, <laughs> <having> <laughs> <around>. Probably. <laughs> we now know each other, but it would have been nice to know her a little bit earlier. <laughs> um. I can nominally tell, it's not that wild, but like a brief fun debate story from my experience. So when um, we found out there was Democratic primary debate, it was going to be MSNBC, Washington Post. So moderators from MSNBC, one Washington Post person. When I found out the Post got it, my first thought was like, I hope they don't choose me. And then like 10 <laughs> seconds later, I was just like, that's insane. Like of all the things you have to worry about, them choosing you is not one of them. And then like a couple days later, I got like a call from my editor. was like, we'd love for you to, you know, be like the co-moderator. Um, so obviously I like, I had to say yes. Um, and so whatever, there's all this training and blah, blah, that I won't bore you with, but you know, it's me. And then it's like three actual television professionals. It was Rachel Maddow, it was Andrea Mitchell, and it was Kristen Welker. Right. Um, and it was me. And I'm like, so like, which, like, which camera do I look into? And so they did like a lot of extra special training sessions with me. Um, but the night of the debate, the producer who was running the debate, who is now the president of MSNBC, um, she's awesome, but she has this ability. So when you prepare for, right, for the debate, you know, you have this book of questions, but everything goes out the window based on what the answers are and who needs more time. So there's someone who can talk in your ear and kind of tell you like, okay, you're going to ask that question, but it's going to go to Senator Klobuchar now, right? Or like, you need to cut Bernie Sanders off or it, what, whatever. I mean, just different things in your ear. And she can talk to one of you um, at the, one of you or all of you or some combination of you. And early on in the debate, I think my, I think I don't totally know. And she, she, she's amazing, could do whatever she wants. And I think Rachel Maddow went rogue. Like, I think she <laughs> jumped to like a question that was supposed to be more at the end. And so the producer, um, accident meant to go into her, and so they're treating me with like kid gloves right like the goal is for me just to like not pass out right like not vomit just like ask my two and a half questions and get through the debate and she means to go into Rachel Maddow's ear but she actually comes into my ear so I hear the message that's like for Rachel Maddow it's like like what the hell did I let you and then, and then there's a pause and she goes sorry Ashley <laughs> Next question to you. <laughs> so it's interesting to see how like real TV people handle things and then like how I was treated. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of nice that she was so so sweet with you. Yeah, they you, were all wonderful. That's really funny. <laughs> oh man, I can't touch that. Um, <laughs> something different. Okay, so in the sort of people can surprise you category and also bizarrely for the second time in the Bill de Blasio category, um, <laughs> So I did a piece for the Times Magazine 2019 um, about him. It was sort of his lame duck period in New York. Um, after we started on the story, he um, entered the presidential campaign in 2020, um, which nobody, including his own advisors, and it was later revealed his own wife, um, <laughs> thought that was a good idea. Um, and it became this like really blistering profile um, I'm generally super suspicious of people who quote themselves, but it's relevant here. So I'll just say briefly that the lead included a description of him running for president in South Carolina um, and so clearly just happy to be out of New York where he was sort of often heckled and um, all the rest. Um, I described him. He had like a new haircut and like skinny jeans and cool guy sneakers. And I said he looked like a brand ambassador for divorced dads trying to get back out there. Um, that's the last time I'd written about him. And then a few months ago... Um, I get a text from Bill de Blasio um, saying, I have sort of a sensitive story. Um, wow. Can you um, get on the phone? I said, sure. So I, I call him that night. Um, long story short, uh, he was separating from his wife um, and was interested in uh, talking about it with her at some length um, in like pretty extraordinarily um, <laughs> forthcoming fashion. Um, and it became this wild um, sort of 
three hour ish interview with the two of them at their uh, home in Brooklyn um, about the ways in which the mayoralty changed their marriage, the ways in which um, they had struggled to sort of um, endure the public scrutiny of all of it, um, the ways in which they had each changed. Um, it became this sort of um, extremely unusual um, and very surreal to your initial prompt um, <laughs> afternoon of like, I can't believe I'm sitting here <laughs> with the former mayor and his wife in the home that they still plan to share as of that moment. He has since apparently gotten an apartment in the Upper West Side. Um, talking about um, something that on paper, like we wouldn't necessarily care a great deal about the fact of um, a marriage ending, although their marriage actually sort of represented something in New York. It was this sort of extremely um, central part of his campaign when he ran. It was this really prominent interracial couple in politics. Um, but sitting there with the two of them as they did like a full scale um, dissection of their own marriage, um, when I had really written, I think probably like, the most blistering thing about him that I'd ever written about anybody um, was a very strange turn. What, what, why do you think he called you? I don't know. We had, I, I'd covered him at City Hall. Um, I, I, we had, you know, I, as, as happens with a lot of people you cover, like you go through the ups and downs um, of writing tough stories and, and re-engaging. And um, I think a, a respect can sort of develop in that moment. Um, I don't know, in this case, um, what prompted it exactly. Obviously, he has the information of other reporters. Um, I hope that he thought, and I, I hope that he does think now, that we, we handle it with care and not in a sort of um, uh, overly um, salacious or like voyeuristic way. Um, and I think that as a matter of like public relations, they didn't want um, some sort of like page six scenario. Mm -hmm. um, with that said, there was an option that was not being spotted by page six with whoever or this three hour interview with me, which was like <laughs> Instagram statement um, <laughs> or something along those lines that uh, they didn't go with. Um, but I genuinely don't know. Yeah, I've, I've always wondered. <laughs> Surreal indeed. Um, yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for this portion, but I'd love to open it up to Q&A. So, um, yeah. Wow. Amazing. Oh, is there a microphone to pass around? Or I... Oh, it's here. Oh, fabulous. Uh, I'm, I'm bringing this to your attention because it's such a serious issue. In Philadelphia, twenty yes. Well, okay, it's between Democrats and Republicans, so I think that's the issue. There's a in the suburbs. There's a man who's considered the most influential man in Pennsylvania. He's Republican, and you know our city is Democratic. And um, in May, they were supposed to eliminate 29 different bus lines, which will be uh, a, a crisis here in Philadelphia. And it is between the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, this man, Pasquale Dion, uh, consider, okay. Uh, um, you asked for an idea, and here's an idea. to write. This could be a national story because uh, because uh, they're um, calling it septabusrevolution.com. And uh, I tried to get in touch with all the theaters and the hospitals, doctors, and um, to tell them that it's going to be af affecting their business uh, because of this uh, crisis in the transportation system. Thank you. Thank you. You're all very good speakers, too. Uh, Chris Hedges was fired from the New York Times for challenging the preemptive war invasion of Iraq. And Phil Donahue was fired from MSNBC for the very same reason. I don't recall anybody from the New York Times or the Washington Post who defended them 
or the hundreds of thousands of victims of that textbook case, that textbook crime against humanity. Uh, isn't it the job of journalists to probe and to expose the lies and to challenge authority rather than being courtiers for this senseless wars that slaughter people en masse? Sure, I mean, I, I think um, <laughs> I, I personally don't know, uh, never encountered either of the gentlemen you mentioned. I was not at the Times at that point. Um, obviously, holding power to account is a huge part of the job. Um, and um, trying to find um, the balance every day between um, reporting what you can stand up um, through sort of rigorous um, research and phone calls and, and double and triple and quadruple checking um, and what you might believe to be true or, or feel to be true um, can be different sort of things. Um, and that standard is often very high. Um, but it really is sort of a case by case. And, and I do think in the wake of the run up to the Iraq war, there have been, and there's people who can speak to this better than I have, but many sort of postmortems and look backs and mea culpas in some cases of how um, some journalists and news organizations, and I'm not like naming anyone specifically, but took the word of government officials um, sort of too earnestly, and, and I do think it has changed some of how we do our journalism, going back to what I said before, when we call people, you know, you're not just taking one person's word on weapons of mass mm -hmm. destruction, right? Like, I think it taught people that you have to call and report, and just because someone is a spokesperson or has an impressive sounding title, it doesn't in any mean way, any way mean they're, they're telling the truth. Um, so I think some of those ramifications you see in reporting now. Hi, thank you guys so much for coming. This has been really inspiring to hear. Um, so I, along with a few of my classmates in here, were lucky enough to have a guest lecture yesterday by Michael Sheehan on um, like his role in coaching debates. And so Ashley, my question specifically for you, but if anyone has anything else to add, that'd be wonderful. Um, we also talked about like the Annenberg Public Policy Report on debates um, along with him, and I just want to know what your thoughts are as a moderator, or as being the moderator, um, how you feel, <laughs> how you felt it's about like- As the most experienced yeah. moderator in the history of debates. As a moderator, um, mo more than most of us can say, um, how the role of audiences play in the debate and how you see their role going forward, if, if you have any opinions on if they should be restricted or totally erased, or if they add a lot of value. Oh, it's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I haven't thought about it enough the way a debate commission has to to have an answer. But you do see how audience responses um, definitely influence the way a, a viewer at home perceives a debate, right? In the same way that laugh tracks or live studio audiences uh, in, influence how people perceive an SNL skit. Um, and I do think you ha you know you had an example of that. And again, I am currently on maternity leave. I have been consuming news the way like a normal person does. So I haven't followed this super closely. But there was a CNN forum for Trump um, where they made the decision to stock the audience uh, not just with Republicans, but sort of with MAGA Republicans. Um, and it definitely and people can decide for better or worse. There was a lot of commentary, but it definitely changed like the tenor um, and how challenging it was or not challenging for the moderator and how the former president responded. So audiences absolutely uh, have a have a huge role. What that should be uh, or how big it should be, I don't know. I don't. I don't think there should be audiences. <laughs> no, like no benefit in my mind. <laughs> totally right. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it's great. <laughs> I think it exists somewhere in the world. It's not for the Hi, my name is Danny, um, and I'm working right now as a political organizer for the state Supreme Court race that's happening in Pennsylvania. And I think my question is, as someone who's like inspires to also get into like political reporting, I was wondering, you mentioned like the skills of writing, reporting, and reaching deadlines, but I was wondering if you have any suggestions on like ways to get involved in politics that has helped you in your career um, while, peop while we're students on campus right now. Hmm. Great question. 
or if you guys got involved no, no, sorry, with I'm... politics while on campus before you were political reporters. So I, I, I was I was never in political organizing. Um, obviously, I'm sure it gives you a fluency in a lot of the issues um, that can inform reporting in the same way. Um, it's obviously a, it's a very different pursuit, advocacy and journalism, um, and um, there is there is certainly overlap in the subject matter and in the expertise and in some of the people you might encounter. Um, but the actual exercise is very different for all sorts of reasons that um, we can talk about. But um, yeah, I, so I, I don't know if or how that would be useful preparation for a future career in um, in political journalism. Um, but having encountered a lot of political organizers um, professionally, um, obviously extremely uh, often you know intelligent and fluent in the issues um, and passionate about the issues, but a different thing than like trying to tell a rigorously reported story about a given subject. It's sort of like the flip side, right? And there's certainly people who have gone from working in politics to journalism. George Stephanopoulos is one example, but I think it's, and this is, this is not to like shut down your advocacy, but I'm, I'm very old school in that like, I think if you want to be a political reporter, like it is probably a lot harder if there is even the perception and, and certainly like the actual facts that you have been advocating for, for a cause or for, you know, or working on behalf of Democrats or Republicans or anything like that. I, I just sort of think like there should be a like a church and state separation. That said, some people have, have made it work, um, but I personally would find that challenging. And if you had your heart set on being a political reporter, I would advise against that. <laughs> <laughs> there are also, I, mean, I, I don't want, <laughs> I, I, the, the only bit I would add is that we, there's a, there's a church and state thing that goes back uh, a long ways at our respective institutions. Um, there is a, a, a moment happening um, that I don't know as much about um, in the sort of advocacy journalism space, um, where a lot of the practices of journalism are applied by people who are overtly advocates. Um, and that's just a different thing than we do, but it does exist. And, and frankly, there are publications where you can write with a point of view. Yeah. Um, so. And also, you're, you're in college right now, so if you want to do political <laughs> yeah. activism now and yeah. then later pursue a career in journalism, I think Absolutely. that's totally, totally fine. I did a summer internship in Capitol Hill my freshman year in college, and you know, no, no one holds that against me now that I'm, I'm a journalist. It was an internship, and it actually gave me a glimpse into you know, the inner workings of, of politics before I decided to sort of cover it from, from the other side. Yeah, I I interned for Chuck Schumer when there I you? when you I did. was in college as well, and um, then I did not go into political reporting <laughs> or politics in general. <laughs> Went into women's magazines instead. <laughs> Those related phenomena. Or? Yes, very. <laughs> Hi, thank you guys so much for coming today. This has been so eye-opening and really wonderful to hear from y'all. You guys talked a bit about how like you sometimes have really un unpredictable moments and aspects of your jobs, but I was wondering if you guys could talk about maybe what like a typical day in your job looks like if one exists. Love that. Um, I think Let's, there is never. I don't think there's ever a typical day. Like it really, it's cool in the sense. Like I, I take for granted, for example, like the fact that we don't have a lot of like Zoom meetings. For example, like a lot of my friends in in in, in New York who are in, in finance consulting or other jobs are always doing meetings all all day. As a journalist, you really set your own schedules schedules in many ways. You'll have maybe the beginning of the week uh, a meeting with your your colleagues who cover the, the same you know area and, and your editor to discuss sort of the stories you're working on for the week but after that it's really you set your own schedule in terms of uh, sources you need to call interviews you need to set up uh, you organize around you know around your deadlines um, and there is you know you do get into a sort of rhythm I cover the governor so I need to be uh, you know check where she's going to be tomorrow what are her going to what her press availabilities are going to be see if i need to show up at her press conference or not um and you also hit a sort of cadence with with your sources right it's it's monday you'll call a, a regular sort of go-to people you have to see sort of what's happening what happened over the weekend what what's what they're hearing might happen that week um 
but at any given moment news can break and you're you have to put everything aside and and, and work on whatever's uh whatever's happening which is i think a lot of fun yeah the, the only thing i would add to that is that um there's a lot of failure within the day <laughs> um <laughs> Maybe just me. Uh, no, just the, you are, um, if you're going through like a list of calls or even meeting people in person in the hopes that you will extract some spectacular nugget for a piece you're working on, if you hit on like 25% of those encounters and feel like you have a useful, actionable detail for your story, that's like pretty good. Um, maybe even way high. Um, so there is a certain amount of, um, tedium to like that exercise but the moments when it breaks through and i feel like it generally karmically kind of does if you do the work and make the calls um those moments sort of justify like the four straight days of going over 50 and trying to like track something down um so the the typical day for me includes a lot of failure is what i'll say yeah actually the last last saturday i, I usually don't work on weekends but we're working on this big story and I, we had to reach this person which I who I couldn't get on the phone I couldn't get over email I couldn't get on Facebook and it was Saturday I was like you know what I'm gonna show up at his at his house we had his his address so I show up at his house he's not there I wait around for like three hours outside his house he, he, he doesn't show up um, so I leave him a note I leave him my card in the in the mailbox and I thought it was the day had been a failure uh, but he called me the next morning and he talked to me and it was actually like a pretty crucial piece of information that that wow. that uh, he gave us for for the story we were working on so putting in the work as tedious as it, as it might be in the moment somehow always you know pays off the old school stuff works yeah huh? it does yeah. hi um my name is nora um my yeah. question is you write like profiles and you mentioned, you know, like for wanting to write like narrative long form pieces. I guess my question was sort of about the genre of political reporting, like the idea of like putting in little quips about what Bill de Blasio was wearing one day, um, but then also having a little bit more like fact based, like very. <laughs> Are you suggesting that's what? not the basis for a whole story? Now? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, but like um, a little bit, I guess, like like the role of like personality in political reporting and like the different genres or like forms of storytelling that you can have within political reporting. Do you see like sort of one particular formula that is repetitive or do you see it sort of changing over time? Um, like do you get a chance to do some of that narrative storytelling that you mentioned? Um, I guess that's my question. Yeah, totally. And I will say one of the reasons I have, I, it feels like we all kind of fell into political reporting, but one of the reasons I've stayed with it for so long and one of the reasons I loved um, and still do love covering campaigns um, is because you kind of get to do all of that. Um, you know, you get to do the fact checks and the the news analysis and the news of the day and those big breaking moments, but you also get to do, even if you're not Matt, you get to do, pro. I mean, you get to do profile writing of the candidate or some of the people around him. And you get to do, um, you know, at the Washington Post on the White House team, or maybe it's just the whole team, but we have these things called debriefs at the Times. I think they were called memos, but they're kind of like voicey little scene pieces. And I did one on, um, like Ted Cruz had absconded to Mexico to Cancun for vacation oh, yeah. when there was a yeah and like at one point and it was just like it just got like crazier by the moment like as the details came out and then like Twitter was making fun of him and like at a certain hour we you know we have a signal chain right with the White House team and we were all kind of just like weighing in and like making observations and at a certain point someone was like you should just like storify this, right? So it's basically just like taking a bunch of like text messages with my really smart colleagues and like adding transitions. So you get to do fun stuff like that. Um, and I also think the best when I was covering Romney, I asked um, Jody Rudorn at the New York Times who had covered, um, or Will Rudorn, right? Because now I work with her sister, who's Debbie Will Gorin. But she had covered John Kerry before me. And I took her out to coffee. And I said, I'm covering Mitt Romney. I'm the reporter who's traveling with him everywhere. Like, what advice do you have for me? And the one thing she said to me that stuck with me um, was, you know, people in this, again, this doesn't mean we don't do fact checks and all those things. She's like, but she's like, if you're an issue voter and you're going to vote on same sex marriage or Second Amendment rights, you can go to the candidate's website and more or less figure out where they stand. And she's like, but you are the person who is with them nonstop. You know what they're like as a human. You know how they treat their staff. You know how they treat their staff when they think no one is looking. You know how they make decisions, right? Are they a sort of 
uh, gut decider like George W. Bush, or are they a, you know, law professor more deliberative um, like Barack Obama? Um, and those things, and you get to tell the reader what they're like. What is their relationship like with their children? How do they think about things? And when you're covering a campaign and when you're running a campaign, you can't think of the stuff you're going to be faced with, right? Like nobody, no reporter thought to ask George W. Bush, what would you do if terrorists hijacked planes and turned them into missiles, right? Like it didn't occur to us to ask, understandably so, right? But like, what if you if you told but you could have told the reader things that might help them understand his response right is who has he surrounded himself with who is he going to ask for advice from right like what does his foreign policy team look like again does he make gut decisions does he you know um and so those are all the kinds of stories that i think are so fun and gratifying to do as a political reporter and last thing like the final adage is always like write the stories that you you and your friends are talking about at the bar um at the end of the night, and and that's not to say that you know re report the off the record stuff, um, <laughs> but oftentimes like what's interesting to your friends and your parents when they call is is of course going to be what's interesting to the reader. So just because it seems like trivial or fun, it can often tell you something broader. And like I'm proud to say that once Michael Babaro and I got a story about Mitt Romney's haircut and his barber on the front page of the New York Times, that's a, right? That's a great Cause, story. Cause we believe it, it said something a little bit more than just about hair. <laughs> the, the one thing I would add just briefly to your first point, for a longer piece w within the framework of that, you can sort of do a lot of those things at once or try to sort of layer in like, you know, the detail about what the former mayor was wearing is like 15 words of a 7,000 word piece that also has a lot of policy implications and, you know, both like a diagnosis of what he might be like as a candidate, what he has been like as a mayor, the effect on people in the city. You can sort of do all of that within a long piece um, in almost a similar way to like the longer portfolio that Ashley is talking about over the course of a campaign. Anyway. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to end with one final question. If you have advice, you know, we, we've sort of talked about advice, but like one piece of advice for somebody who wants to go into political journalism who maybe is has nowhere to even no idea even where to start. Like, what what would you say to them? The DP. <laughs> start at the DP. Apply for the Nora Prize. we probably all worked at the DP. Uh, you have city publications and newspapers here that have internships, I assume still. Um, those, I think, were also launching pads for us. Um, and pitch stories as well. Steven is a big proponent of that. Um, and in terms of actually advice for doing the job, I, one of the, the, the top advice I've gotten is write what they do, not what they say. And I, f I feel that's like a guiding principle for uh, political journalism, but political journalism specifically. Um, I would also say be persistent. Every year at Penn, I had I got one in, one journalism internship. Um, or I did an internship, but like I applied to probably every year like forty or fifty places, and it wasn't that I chose the best one. Like I got one. Like each <laughs> summer, like one of those to the failure point, right? Like one of those fifty applications <laughs> landed, right? And so you have to be really persistent. Also, when you're applying for jobs, and I think this is especially true to be stereotypical for women or certainly for myself. Like I always hate to feel like a pain or a pest. Um, and lots of times you end up in someone's email because you're trying to get coffee with them or you're trying to pitch a story or trying to follow up on an application. And you never know, like, should I follow up? I don't want to bother them. I don't want to annoy them. Um, and it's one of the rare things where like oftentimes they're like, oh, yeah, I've started this. I'm going to get back to them. But their day gets busy. But it's one of the rare things where you being like annoying and persistent to a good editor or good journalist is going to earn their begrudging respect because they think like if she's being or he is being this persistent and annoying to me, right? Like imagine what she'll do when I stick around the governor. Um, so I would just encourage you to repeatedly follow up. Um, I'd love that. Um, have lunch with Kathy Hochul. Um, um, no, I, the last thing I'll say, I, all of us are current or former um, zealous champions of the Metro Desk, or I guess current champions, but uh, former uh, <laughs> members of the Metro Desk. Yeah. And a, a city reporting experience, even if it's not an overtly like politics only beat, is such a um, kind of perfect combination of like policy and politics and humanity and kind of universal experiences of like 
how, you know, a fare increase on the train will affect X, Y, and Z housing. Like it, it just, it's such a vast net of possible stories. If there's any way to write, whether it's in Philly or elsewhere, um, for like a proper Metro desk to the extent that those still exist in great numbers. Um, that is just, that I found that to be like such an essential part of my kind of early journalism life. Fantastic. Well, before we give our incredible panelists a round of applause, I just want to remind everybody that if you are interested in being a reporter full time, being a journalist, please apply to the Nora Prize. It's such an incredible organization that we're also grateful to be a part of. And if you want to hear more about getting a career, finding a career, getting a job in journalism, uh, most of us will be back here tonight at 530 to do an even bigger panel specifically on that with even more awesome people from the Nora Prize. Um, and if you're interested in even more dissection of storytelling, <laughs> we'll be in the uh, critical writing program, pr writing CPCW. CPCW. <laughs> Tomorrow at 9.30, there's some, a few spots still available. 9.30 on a Friday, let's do it. 9.30 on. on a Friday, we'll be there with coffee. Um, but thank you so much to these incredible panelists and for all of you for coming out. It was so great. Thank you, Jess, for moderating. Yeah. Have as much moderating experience as I do. <laughs> this was way more questions you had to ask. That's true. I